morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church. It's very nice to see everybody here today. The scripture says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Now, I've made just a short list here of his benefits. There are many of these, but here's a few. He loves us. He cares for us. He meets our needs. He extends grace to us. And he's with us through the good times and through the bad times. Well, we have many benefits that we've received from the Lord. That's a few. I'd like to ask you to stand at this time. And let's lift our hearts. Let's bless the Lord and thank him for all that he's done. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. standing is just so fitting right now to pray. So let's pray. Bow your head with me, will you? Father, indeed, we bless your great and holy name. You made us and love us. You sought us and you found us. You forgive us 
and you give us all we need or could ever want. We have meaning and purpose because you call us and empower us and you send us into your world. So for all this and so much more, we bless your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we mean what we just sang. We bless your name in times of abundance and in times of want, good times and bad. You give and you take away. Yet, Lord, our hearts choose to say, blessed be your name. We bless you most of all for what we see of you and receive from you in Jesus Christ. There is a name we love to hear. We love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in our ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how we love Jesus. Bring us closer to Jesus today. So in this service, focus us, stir us, draw us and lead us to make us more like Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, greetings to each one of you. And may I say, from each one of you to each one of you. I'm Brad Mullen, one of the pastors here, but I also like to think of myself as uh, a facilitator of greeting. Uh, because I want to make us conscious of the fact that we're all connected to one another, and it's important that we recognize this. And, uh, you know, we're at a time when summertime, folks moving around, vacationing, visiting, and uh, we might have some guests here that are here for the very first time, and, uh, or newish to Calvary Church. And if that describes you, we have a little touch point, a venue where we'd love to meet you. We don't want you to just come and go and never connect with anybody. Uh, it's called the Welcome Gathering, and it takes place after every service, 10 minutes or so. Meet Pastor Bo and other folks in the staff and uh, other people who are guests today as well. You say, where is it? Simple. Head out the doors, turn to the right, and before you go out the exit there, the east exit or entrance, uh, the room is just to the right. Pastor Bo will remind you about this uh, later, but we'd love to have you come if you're new or uh, relatively new to Calvary Church. I see our ushers there uh, are poised with the baskets. Gentlemen, why don't you come forward and let's receive this morning's offering. Uh, and while they do, let me tell you about what also is happening right after this service. We're going to have lunch. And there's two important reasons why you should be at lunch. Reason number one, we're serving chicken salad. And that's a favorite. And this is not the kind of chicken salad where you have to search for the chicken. There's really chunky chicken salad that we serve here. And if you sweet talk the server, maybe they'll give you a bigger portion. I don't know. I've never tried it myself, but uh, uh, it's worth a try. That's reason number one. Reason number two is we have about 20 of our global partners here today, and they're going to be available at lunch chit-chat, uh, but it's not going to be in the fellowship hall where lunch is. It's going to be on the other side of the lobby in the fifth grade classroom. So if you'd like to connect with some of our global partners, that would be an ideal place for you to do it. Our ushers are taking the offering. I just want to remind you, this is not a commercial break in the service. This is an act of worship. Your giving is an act of worship. Whether you give online, or the basket's passed and you put some cash in there, or write a check, use an envelope, you're giving to the Lord. I often think when writing a check, when you put Calvary Church on the check, that's really not technically, theologically accurate. You're giving to the Lord. The problem is if you put the Lord on the check, we'd have a problem cashing it. <laughs> so keep putting Calvary Church, but remember, I, this is giving to the Lord. I don't know if it's crept up on you, but this week we hit the midpoint of 2017. Half gone. Whew. That's the way time goes. It's also the end of our fiscal year at Calvary Church. And if you look 
uh, in your bulletin, you'll see a kind of a summary of where we are financially this fiscal year, and you will, along with all of us, I think say, thank you, Lord. We thank you for your generosity. Uh, giving has been strong. The financial position of Calvary Church is great. If you want to give an end of the fiscal year gift, you'll notice that global ministry, building ministry, a building fund, that would be a great place to do it. Whenever you give to Calvary Church, it helps to propel ministry forward, and we thank you. Now, my friend, Pastor John Fry, we're about to sing one of these great hymns, I think, of the faith, at least in my lifetime, to God be the glory. It's a standard, it's timeless in what it is uh, saying to the Lord. Uh, I love the way the verse kind of builds. It goes, starts low, and it gets higher. And then when you get to the chorus, we're going to have a shout and kind of an echo. It's a magnificent hymn. And I don't want to lead it, though it seems like I'm angling to lead it. I'd love to lead it if I could. You're the one uh, to lead it. But uh, I think when the choir and orchestra hits the congregation somewhere in the middle, it's magnificent. And I'm looking forward to praising the Lord with all of us together. And we can't sing it sitting down. No. no. We need to stand. <laughs> to God be the glory. Let's sing it to the Lord.
Well, good morning, everyone. I offer you my greeting and welcome as well. My name is Bo, the senior pastor here at Calvary Church. And as you can see from the bulletin, from the roll-in video we just saw from the lobby, um, I am thrilled to beginning a new series, our summer series, here at Calvary Church called Freed Up, a study through the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, They're still here. We're going to do church in the round today as we're going to sing and worship a bit more later, uh, connected with communion. Um, But in starting a new series, I just find it's a great opportunity to just make sure that all of us are on the same page, particularly because I know there's been a lot of newer people coming to Calvary Church of late. And so some people have even said to me, well, you talk about a, a sermon series or a series of message, messages. What, what, what is all that about? Um, here at Calvary Church, when we gather here on Sunday morning, we, we pray, we sing, uh, we share what's kind of going on in the life of this family, we take up an offering and um, but one of the things we always do every week is open up God's word together and we do a a series of messages from the Bible and those series of messages are all connected from one week to the other sometimes it's based on a topic topic that's relevant to our lives relevant from scripture so we just finished six weeks talking about truth and what truth is and how do we know what truth is and sometimes we do a book study study a book of the bible like we're doing now starting in the new testament letter uh, to the galatians but whether it's topical or whether it's a book study it's all biblically based and it's all purposeful purposeful for who we are, purposeful uh, for, for what we need, purposeful for us as a church. And it's targeted and geared towards all of us, towards the whole family of Calvary Church, and even towards those that are brand new with us. And many of you get that, and you understand what we're doing. Somebody just recently wrote me a note, and they said this in the note. I appreciate how you have something for the veteran Christians, as well as new believers so that all of us are challenged from the scriptures and it will help us to pursue God in our walk with him. But some come and say, well, I wish we could go a little bit deeper. Well, we've created environments for you to do that. That's why we did the apologetics elective that's finishing up here this morning. And many of you, that's what happens in your ABF or small group environments. But others have said, well... I wish there was a place that I could pull back and just ask some of the more basic questions, a safe place without feeling like, you know, I don't know anything or feeling, and and we're creating those environments as well. And you're going to be hearing more about that uh, starting up now in the fall, a place where people can come and a safe place to ask questions about God, about the Bible, uh, and we want that to be true. But when we come here together, we think that even as we open up God's word, there's something here for all of us. So as we begin this series, I don't know if you've noticed out in the lobby, but big up in the overlook area, there's a graphic visual of the entire book of Galatians. I know as you try to see and interpret it up here on the screens, you can't even really understand what it is. So stop out in the lobby, look at that overlook area. Sometimes the, the visual of it gives you the nice overview of the book, and on the, on the video screen opposite of this in the, in the lobby, you can see it uh, kind of being put all together, and there's a link there that shows that you can go and see that on our website. But this is a book, the study of Galatians, it's a book for all of us, no matter where we might be in our walk, in our journey with God. And as you see, the, the, the series, the, the title of, the, of this series is called Freed Up. And each of the message titles has some common phrase uh, with the word free that will connect with each of the messages. And on the back of your bulletin, you can see a description of the series. You can see each of the message titles and you can see the passages that we're going to study each week so that you can read and look ahead as we do this. But this is a series that's about freedom. And when we say freedom, we say free from what and free for what? And you're going to see that develop and, and be unpacked starting today, but throughout each of the weeks. But one of the things that's, that's happened here in the book, and sometimes this is one of the things that happens to us, we start well and we understand that the gospel was about Jesus, but then people or even our own inclinations or sometimes even a church will come and say, yeah, it's fine to start with Jesus, but now you have to add this 
to Jesus. In order to be godly, you need Jesus plus these rules or Jesus plus this. In order to be a real spiritual person, you need, you know, not just Jesus, but you need to dress this way and sing these songs and act this way and do your devotions this way. And, and, and sometimes things get added to Jesus and when things get added to Jesus the gospel is distorted and the freedom that we have we become enslaved and into to bondage you even saw that on the video that the kids are having a great time playing with the boxes but then the signs come in no boys no girls no pets quiet please ages eight and up and it takes away that freedom and then those signs and rules get ripped down and the freedom comes again. So we want to look during this series of what are the things that are boxing us in in our lives and particularly our spiritual lives and how do we break free from that in our relationship with God and our relationship with others and even personally and freed up as we understand how God thinks and how God feels about us. Some of you are enslaved and, and in bondage because of the way that you believe that God perceives you. And we'll talk about that throughout this series. But freedom is found in the message of the gospel. And gospel is a, a Bible word. It's a church word. And some are more familiar with it than others. But as we unpack the gospel through the book of Galatians, we want to make sure that everybody is very familiar with this word. The good news of what Jesus has done for us. And some people view the gospel and, oh, that's just a prayer that I pray in order to get to heaven. Or that's just for somebody that doesn't yet have a relationship with God. And that's one of the misconceptions about the gospel. And we start and be, we begin with the gospel, but then we try to be godly and spiritual and sanctified on our own. And the believer needs the gospel just as much as the non-believer does. We all need the gospel. So over these next 11 weeks, we're going to see what freedom looks like in the gospel of Jesus Christ as presented by Paul in the letter to the Galatians. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to meet me at Galatians chapter 1. It's found on page 972 in the pew Bible that's in front of you. You can open up the Bible, you can turn on an electronic device, whatever it is to get those words in front of you. Some of you know my preaching style that I'll put the words, the scripture passages up here on the screen. But there is great value in you having the Bible opened in front of you. And here's why. Because I'm not just trying to to preach to you and to feed you from God's word once a week. I want to equip you, we here at Calvary Church want to equip you to be a self-feeder from the Word of God. And the more comfortable you are seeing the words and reading the words and interacting with the words and seeing the connections that are there, the more comfortable you will feel to read and to study and to look into it on your own. Today we will look at the first five verses of chapter 1, which says this. Paul an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, And the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I pray that you would use your word, use this book of Galatians to free us up from whatever may be entangling us. May we dig deep so that this book and the freedom that comes from the truth of the gospel would bury down deep into our hearts and into our minds 
that it would create a firm foundation, that it would grow up and bear fruit in our lives to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin by looking at God's messenger, Paul. God is at work, but he wants to use people to accomplish his work. So the letter begins, Paul, an apostle. Now when you and I write a letter, we start with who the letter is written to. In this cultural context, they begin with who is writing the letter. So the letter is not written to Paul. The letter is written from Paul. And right off the bat, he tells us not only who he is, but he tells us his authority. He tells us his, in a sense, job description because he's going to be addressing a problem. And he needs them to know right off the bat who he is and the authority that he has in order to address that problem. The same is true in our lives. If you're lying in a hospital bed and you need surgery, and a person walks in the room and says, good morning, I'm Jim, your surgeon. That's what you want to hear. You don't want him to come in and say, good morning, I'm Jim, a circus clown. No, his description and the authority of what he, who he is allows him to do and to accomplish what needs to be done. So right off the bat, Paul tells us who he is, and he begins by talking about his authority as an apostle. Now, an apostle is a sent one. But there's different nuances to this word. In one sense, every follower of Jesus Christ is an apostle. Every one of us is an ambassador, a sent one, on his behalf. We have many of our Calvary Church global partners, people that have been sent out by Calvary Church that are here with us this weekend. But Paul distinguishes himself from that type of an apostle. He's an apostle in more of a technical sense. Look what he says. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man. I'm not being sent out by a person. I'm not being sent out, in a sense, by a church. But I am an apostle through Jesus Christ and God the Father. He has seen the risen Lord. He has seen the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, and it qualifies him to be an apostle in the same way that the others were. It qualifies him to be counted in those that are the foundation of the church, as he talks about in the book of Ephesians. Sent by Jesus with the authority of God. And we will talk more about his apostleship in the weeks to come. This is just the introduction. But there's two key thoughts. One thought is this. Paul needs to establish his authority. Why? Because there's some that are preaching a message to these people in these churches of Galatia that say, Paul is an imposter. And they recognize that if they can discredit the messenger, they can then discredit the message. And he says, no, I'm going to begin this book. I'm going to spend about two chapters making sure that you know my credentials, that you know who I am, that I am authoritatively sent by Jesus Christ. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as his authoritative messenger... This is a message from God, and this is a message that we need. Galatians, as is the rest of the Word of God, is the Word of God. Come to us through an authoritative representative. I'm afraid that sometimes we open up our Bibles and maybe we read a verse here or we read a verse in the morning or we have a little Bible on a, you know, flip calendar or whatever it might be, and it's as if we just need a little boost, a little shot in the arm. And nothing wrong with that, but 
Do we recognize what we have? The authoritative word of God given to us by an authoritative messenger that should transform us. That we need to be willing to plumb the depths of Scripture to really dig into God's word and to see what it has to say to us and the transformative power that it can do in our lives. That it can transform our relationships. That it transforms the way we treat one another. That it can transform our marriage. That it can transform our parenting. That it can transform the way that we interact with our co-workers. It can transform the way that we handle our finances. It can transform the way that we think about what's going on in the world today. It can transform the way that we think about our political processes. The depths of God's word is not something to just, oh, you know, I read a verse here, I read a verse there, I get a little shot in the arm in the morning. No, let's be people that are known for digging into the Word of God and then living it out. Don't underestimate what we have here in front of us from God's authoritative messengers. If we don't, then what will drive us is our own thinking and our own hearts and, and our traditions. If we're not transformed by the word of God, what we will look to to guide and to lead us is just the way things have always been done. Let's dig into God's word and allow it to transform every aspect of our lives. More to come on the authority of Paul. Paul, an apostle... And then he says, and all the brothers who are with me, even though Paul is different from them as an apostle, he is not a solo act. He understands the need for the different people and the different gifting in the body of Christ. So nearly every letter he writes, he always acknowledges the people that are with him, ministering with him, ministering to him, helping and strengthening and equipping the churches. All the brothers that are with me, and then he says, to the churches of Galatia. He's writing this letter not to one church, but to churches. To churches that he began, to churches that he planted when he went out on his first missionary journey. Paul was a persecutor of the church, but then he saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And God, and through Jesus, sent him out to preach the message, to begin churches, to begin local churches, just like we are here today. And you can read about this first missionary journey where the churches in Galatia were planted in Acts 13 and Acts 14, particularly in Acts 14. And you can see the pattern of Paul coming and preaching the gospel and people getting saved and churches beginning. But then opposition would come. Opposition would come almost immediately and we see one example of this when they went to Iconium in in Acts chapter 4 chapter 14 verse 2 Dr. Luke tells us this that many believed when Paul preached the gospel but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers they came in and distorted the message that Paul was preaching. This is why Paul then writes the letter of Galatians to correct some of that poisoning that was taking place. And we come to the end of Acts chapter 14. And again, this is just setting up the context for the book that he wrote. When they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples... Disciples are made, people get saved when the gospel is preached. They return to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And here's what they did as they returned through those cities. They strengthened the souls of the disciples. The church was planted, the gospel was preached. But people were coming in with a different message. People were poisoning the message of the gospel. So Paul comes back and he's strengthening that church. And he's encouraging them to continue in the faith. That's what he was doing. In a sense, that's what we do as we gather as a local church. Some of you live hard and difficult lives. You have difficult work settings and work environments and difficult relationships. But you're in a small group or you're in an ABF or you're spending time in God's word. Or you're here on Sunday mornings with everybody else. And there's something that's strengthening and encouraging to you 
about that. That's what the church should be. That's what the church should be bringing about. A strengthening and encouraging. That's what Paul was doing. But when people were distorting his message, he felt compelled to write this letter back to them to correct that distortion. And that's what we're going to look at over these next weeks. Many believe, and I, I, I concur, this is probably the fir- very first New Testament letter that Paul wrote. And you're going to see a tone in here that I would call a compassionate rage. He is angry that somebody has distorted the message of the gospel. He's angry that though they started by faith in Jesus, they're now trying to be perfected in the flesh. But there's a personal connection here that he has with them. He preached the gospel to them. He got to know them. He started these churches. He he assigned elders to, to, to lead these churches. So it's almost in a personal affront to him that they're turning from the gospel that he preached And he writes this letter with a compassionate rage to try to get them back on track. That's the messenger. Now let's talk briefly about the message that he preached. And again, these verses is just a summary. Just a summary of the message of the gospel that we will develop throughout the rest of this series. But look at the depth that he gives us even in these three short verses. He says in verse 3, grace to you and peace. These sound like just a nice greeting. Just a nice kind of formal formality in the way that he starts the letter. And these words are the heart and the soul of a Christian greeting because they are the heart and the soul of the message of the gospel. So even though they're a greeting, dig deep into the meanings of these words. Words. Grace is an unconditional free gift. The world says that you should get what you deserve. You do good, you should get good. You do bad, you should get bad. But the message of the gospel and the message that comes from God is that what God has done for us is an unconditional free gift that we don't work for, that we can't earn but it's by grace. So Paul says, grace to you. Grace to you from God. This is what God says to you. Some of you maybe need to put that on your mirror and see that each and every morning when you wake up. Because your self-talk is saying, it's as if God may be saying to you, anger to you, judgment to you, displeasure to you. Some of us, that's how we think that what God is saying to us. My four girls have recently gotten me into listening to the audio books of Junie B. Jones. Anybody know Junie B. Jones? I see some smiles out there. I know there's some kids here with us this morning. Junie B. Junie B. Jones is a charismatic kindergartner. And as you listen to her stories or read her stories... It's amazing the things that she gets into, and it's fun to listen to. And I've kind of become hooked on these things, even to the point that even when my kids aren't in the car, I'm listening to the audiobook. Now, don't tell them that. But it's amazing just the perspective that a kindergartner can bring. So I love the way that she sees life. And so she says things like this. She says, when somebody's frustrated, they do... A huffy breath. Do you know what a huffy breath is? Of course you do, because we all do a huffy breath. <sighs> That's a huffy breath, whether you realize it or not. And she also talks about when somebody doesn't like what's going on, they do a frowny face. Have you ever done a frowny face? Of course you've done a frowny face. You just haven't worded it quite that well. So I love the way that Junie B. Jones sees and thinks of the world. But some of you, you go through your life and you go through your day and you think that God is doing a huffy breath at you all the time. That he's just looking down at what you do and how you live your life and he's going, (sighs) there they go again. Or that whenever you do something, he's giving you a frowny face. 
And that's your perspective and that's your view of God. But in the message of the gospel, Paul begins this letter by saying, grace to you, not huffy breath to you, not frowny face to you, but grace to you. Do you know why? Because of the peace that he has accomplished for us. Grace to you in peace. And it's not just a peace from God, but it's a peace with God. It's a judicial peace, something that we experience, but something that's true no matter how we feel because of the message of the gospel. So because of the peace of God, we don't have to do a huffy breath, but we can take a deep breath and say, God, thank you that I have peace with you. And that I don't have to continually try to earn what you've done. I don't have to earn peace with you. I don't have to earn your favor. But I can just take a big, deep sigh of relief because there's grace and there's peace in the message of the gospel. You know what grace and peace are? They're words of freedom. It frees us up. So many of us are living lives that are marked by guilt and insecurity and bitterness and jealousy. But when we understand the grace and the peace that comes from God and the gospel, we recognize that we don't need to find our self-worth in what we do. We don't need to find our self-worth as we compare ourselves to others. But our self-worth is grounded in my relationship with God that comes by grace and is marked by peace. Therefore, when we understand this freedom, I'm then free to approach other people with an other-centered mentality. Whether we realize it or not, we approach relationships with other people with this mentality of how am I going to manipulate this relationship and how am I going to say things and how am I going to do things to build into my self-worth as I relate to other people. No, when we understand the message of the gospel and the freedom that it brings, we can truly come to other people with an other-centered serving mentality and we'll talk about that freedom throughout the rest of the book. And this grace and this peace, who does it come from? It comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How does it come? How did we get it? How was it accomplished? He tells us in verse 4. Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. And I know. I know that there's many of you that sit there and you've been in church your whole life and you know. You know that Jesus died for your sins. And now's the time to kind of sit back and say, oh, here we go again. And you're doing a little bit of a huffy breath. Don't take for granted the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and particularly that little word, for. He gave himself on behalf of. He gave himself in place of. He gave himself as a payment, as a replacement, as a substitution. He took on what we deserved. He took on what our sins deserved, the penalty of sin. He did for me what I can't do for myself. The religious systems of the world says, you ought to do this, so try harder. Try harder. God says you can't do it. So Jesus gave himself for our sins to accomplish what we couldn't accomplish. One of the distortions, the subtle distortions of the gospel, not the only one, but just one of many that I want to mention this morning. Again, we'll talk more about this as we go through the book. Sometimes we think that in the gospel, Jesus just bought us a second chance a second opportunity. Okay, I know you've screwed up once, but I'm giving you an oppor- another opportunity. Now go and try harder the next time. You can do it if you just try harder the next time. It, ma- it makes me think of this illustration, and you know that all illustrations break down. But I think of a carnival game. Many carnival games involve some sort of a ball. Sometimes it's throw the ball and knock down the little milk jugs. 
I think those things are weighted or attached or something because they never all seem to fall off the shelf. Or how about the one where you're supposed to throw the softball and it's actually supposed to go in that big milk jug thing? Well, to me, that hole is smaller than the ball. It just seems to never go in. Or how about the, how about the ring toss game? Can you all picture the ring toss game? You throw the ring and there's those green glass bottles. Some of you can hear the sound right now of all the rings hitting those bottles and falling down in between them. And sometimes I think the way that we view the gospel is the way that we view our parents. We throw the ball and maybe we knocked one down, but we couldn't get them all knocked down. We throw three and it doesn't go in the jug. And we throw the rings and they don't go on. And here's mom or dad with a dollar that says, here, try again. Here's another opportunity. Here's a second chance to try to get it right. And we try again and we can't do it. But Jesus, in the message of the gospel, comes and he says, step aside. He says, step aside. Let me take your place. Let me do for you what you're not able to do. Don't let that ever get old, no matter how old you might be. If there was another way, if there was another way for him to accomplish for us to accomplish what needed to be done. If he could say, do good works for your sins. Follow these set of rules and that will take care of the problem of sin. If there was another way, why send Jesus to die on the cross? you got to wrestle with that. If it's Jesus plus something else, are we saying that the death of Christ is not sufficient enough that we have to add to it? If there was another way, then why send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins? He gave himself for our sins to, in order to, in order to what? To deliver us. It's a strong word. It means to rescue it's where the title of this message comes from. Free delivery. Makes you think of an Amazon ad. Free shipping. No, this is delivery. This is rescue. And this is free rescue. Free delivery. Jesus came as a rescuer. He came as a teacher. But not just a teacher. And even in this brief description of Jesus here in these opening words, he doesn't talk anything about Jesus as a teacher, but he talks about Jesus as a rescuer. Do you know why? Because you don't throw a drowning person a manual about how to swim. You rescue them. And that's who Jesus is. And that's primarily why he came. To deliver to rescue. To rescue from what? To deliver from what? Because a delivery implies from and to. When a package is delivered, it comes from and it goes to. What did he deliver us from? We well, say, well, he delivered us from our sin. Yes, but in Paul's brief description here, he broadens it. And he says, to deliver us from the present evil age. You ready? Let's dig a little bit deeper. Put your thinking caps on with me. We are living in the present evil age. It's what Paul just talks about. All of us are born both physically and spiritually into the present evil age that's marked and ruled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Paul says, this is what he has delivered us from. But if he's delivered us from that, what has he delivered us to? He's delivered us to the age to come. Scripture talks about the age to come. 
And by the coming of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit, that age to come has burst onto the scene. It's not yet fully consummated, but it's been inaugurated. And we have the benefits of the age to come. And so he's delivered us from the evil age into the age to come. And we begin to experience in our relationship with Jesus Christ the power of the Holy Spirit that's working in our lives. We won't be fully and finally freed up until that age is fully consummated and we're fully in our glory with the Lord Jesus. But that age has begun. But really, a better visual and a better picture of it is this. It's the overlapping. The age to come has entered into and overlaps with the present evil age. And we, in a sense, are physically in the world, but we are marked by the age to come because we are in Christ. Jesus, as we just studied this past spring in John's Gospel, in the world, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. This is common biblical language. The world and the age to come. This present age and the age to come. I think it's better described by Paul in one of his other letters in the book of Colossians. He says this, remember the two circles. He has delivered us from the dominion of of darkness from this present age and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son transferred us into the age to come the writer of Hebrews even describes that age to come and how we ex even experience it even now you've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come so we're going to talk more about this age to come throughout this whole series but again another familiar verse to many of you but look at it in this context. Paul in Romans 12, chapter two, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. The word literally means this age. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think like a person that's part of the age to come. Think like a person who has all of the benefits of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because of what he has delivered us from. And because where he has delivered us to. He gave himself for our sins in order to deliver us from the present evil age. According to what? According to all your good works? No, according to the will of our God and Father. That's what he says. No merit of mine, not according to my works, not even according to the amount of faith that I can muster, but according to the object of my faith. And as a result, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. Doesn't that make sense that God would get the glory? And he says it right there at the end. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at these three verses up here on the screen. Look at this summary of them. Grace to you. Glory to God. It begins by him saying, grace to you. All of us receive grace. God receives the glory. Why? Because of what's put right there, sandwiched right there in the middle. Because Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us, to rescue us. Grace to you. Glory to God. Because of the cross, and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message. And that's the power of the gospel. This is what we're going to dig deep into this summer. This is just the beginning. But if all we had was just those three verses, that's the gospel. Grace and peace to you. Glory to God. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to rescue us and to deliver us. So with that in mind, I don't think there's any better way to celebrate and to remember that than to come to the communion table. To take a piece of bread and take a little cup of juice and it reminds us of this deliverance 
It reminds us of this rescue. So before we come and before we take this, we're going to sing. Ashley's going to come and lead us in a song. We want to join with her and sing in response to this message. As we're singing, the men that are going to be down here, you can come while we're singing. And then after that, I will lead us through the instructions and we'll take communion together. Let's rise to our feet and let's sing together.
together this morning. We're going to do a little bit different than we, that some of you might be used to. Instead of passing the bread and then passing the cup separately, we're going to pass them together. You're going to see a picture up here on the screen. You're actually going to take two cups at once. There'll be a cup on the bottom that has the bread and a cup on top that has the juice. So make sure you don't just take the top cup or you're only going to get half. Take the bottom so that you have both cups uh, together and, uh, and everybody will be served that way as we're serving. Choir and orchestra are going to lead us. Uh, John will invite us to sing as part of that process. We'll remain seated through that. And then once everybody is served, including the choir and orchestra, I will then come and lead us and we'll take the bread and we'll take the cup together. There's nothing magical about the bread and about the juice. It's a physical reminder of a spiritual truth. We're not saved because we take communion. We're saved because we put our faith and our trust in the unconditional free gift of what Jesus has accomplished for us. This is just a reminder. It's a way for us to to give thanks for what he has done. I know there's lots of kids in the room. Parents, use this as a great teaching time. Tell them, explain to them what we're doing, and you know where they are spiritually, and if they're uh, old enough and understand, they're more than welcome to take this with us. You don't have to be a member of Calvary Church to take this with us. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are welcome uh, to, to join with us as we receive communion this morning. Let's bow, let's pray together. Father, thank you for sending Jesus for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. His broken body, his shed blood, washes and covers over our sin. And we gain access to that just by putting our faith and trust in him, just by coming and recognizing, I can't do anything, you've done it all transferring our trust from ourselves to you. And what we're about to do, Father, as you've given it to us, it's just a picture of that truth. And we give you thanks for it now in Jesus' name. Amen.
piece of bread. And it's through the authority of the Apostle Paul who gives us these instructions in his letter to the Corinthian church. And he says this. He says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and let's eat together. on and he says in the same way he also took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood Jesus is saying this do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let's take and let's drink together Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's sing about that wonderful Savior who has delivered us.
what a Savior. If I can introduce you to that Savior, I'd love to have the opportunity to do that right here today, this morning. The gospel frees us up, and we're going to dig deep this summer, so I hope you'll come back. If you can't be here, we know there's vacation, you can't be here every week, follow along on the podcast, listen online, uh, stay connected with what we're doing, and I think it will be a blessing to you. Reminder of the welcome gathering out the doors to your right. Chicken salad is served right now in Fellowship Hall. Head over there, hang out there, fellowship there, or grab some, go to the fifth grade room, connect with some of our global partners. We'll see you next week for week two of Freed Up.